Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. 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 Speak your praise. Just speak it. Speak your praise to him. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Come on, vocalize it right where you're at. Just speak a praise. Use your tongue. Use your vocal cords. Use your lips and start praising him. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I praise you, Jesus. I honor you tonight. I want more of you. I long for you, God. I praise you. I honor you. I give you glory. I give you power. I give you tonight. Lord Jesus, all my attention, all my emotion, all of my spirit, soul, mind, and body, I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. There is none like you. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you. I think, uh, I think we ought to lift our hands and we ought to all pray together. Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. We're praying it over our nation. We're praying it over all the nations of the world. We're praying it over the Middle East. We're praying it over Jerusalem. We're praying it over Israel. We're praying it over the Palestinian people, men, women, children, babies that are in danger zones. You know, if you don't know we're pro-Israel, you don't know nothing, but I'm also pro-people pro-human beings. My heart goes out. My heart goes out. We love, Jesus loves all of us the same. But we also know that the, there is prophecy that Israel, the land of Israel and the people of Israel, God has a very special purpose for. But He will hear the cry of anyone who will call out to it through Jesus Christ. And we pray together. Ready? Y'all got it? The Lord's Prayer. We ready? Ready, go. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Give the Lord a mighty praise. There's power in that prayer. God bless you. You may be seated. We, we, he just told me that we have over a thousand in the overflow right now. That's pretty amazing. And are we do, going to do what we said with, with the college students? And Okay, so here's one thing we can do. And thank you, choir. Let me hear it for this amazing choir. And man, I looked up this morning and when I didn't see this side, I, I was like, Lord, I'm a little bit sad. I, I got my cup half full of choir people this morning. But boy, to, to see them back here tonight, beautiful, because they had to go to their campus and do their thing. But um, praise the Lord. Now, how many college, college, uh, Free Chapel College students do I have in the house? Raise your hand. Let me see your hand. I need to see your hands. Raise them high. I see about three or four. <laughs> Looks like seven or eight or nine. Yeah. Well, there's several hundred in there somewhere. I guess they're all around. I need you to do something for me, if you will. Think about it. Pray about it. And how many of you are regular at uh, at Free Chapel Youth uh, on, on Wednesday nights? Let me see your hand. Okay. Well, there's a good group. Um, I'm trying to figure this out. You think we'll be okay with that? All right. I'm going to ask you all to do something. If you want to, it's going to be real different. But we can allow you to sit up here around and I asked Perry if he wanted to do this and it was actually his idea. So if you want to come, don't stampede, but if you want to come 
and it's a hard floor. You don't have to, but if you want to give your seat up for some people out there who are still coming in wanting to get in, so be it. And just kind of give a perimeter, you know, like this. Leave your phone in your pocket. I don't want no phones up here. I don't want no texting up here. I don't want no, uh, nobody doing selfies up here. No, 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 guys, right here, just, just around. Is that, huh? Oh, they can sit on the, great idea. See, see, there you go, great idea. And some of you go this way. There's a bunch of them over there too, guys. So maybe you and your girlfriend won't get to sit together, but it'll be all right. So, hey, here comes the people now. Good, 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 good. Isn't that a, God, Jehovah Jireh made a way for you. They hit it just right. They're getting better seats than all of you way up there somewhere. They came to church late. I don't know what that means. Favor ain't fair. Somebody paid their tithes. That's all I can say. Somebody paid their tithes. And... Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, okay. Uh, if you run out of space over there, sit them behind them. And, you know, just sit them. You're probably going to have to sit on the ground, and good luck with that. But, uh, the, but, you know, we figured young people can do that a lot better than old people. Say amen, somebody. I think we've got about all we can get up here just about, but I like this. Should we, is that, boy, I gotta, we gotta, we gotta stay in good favor with the fire marshal. Amen. That's all I can see right now. Bless him, Lord. Bless him. We appreciate them, don't we? We appreciate people who look after us. We really do. We really do. They're so important. They're so important. This is awesome. What a tremendous problem. <laughs> on a Sunday night. <laughs> well, Perry, I'm trying to let things calm down before I bring you up here. We don't have anything else to say or do, but uh, amazing this morning what the Lord did, and we're so thankful to have all of you here. If you've never been, welcome to the revival. It started last Sunday night just like this, and we have not let up and uh, we're just going to go on and go through Wednesday night. We'll just go on and do it. I don't, I don't have any reason not to. And, and so we'll see what the Lord wants to do. But we're going to give it all we got. I can't promise you anything beyond that, but I can tell you we're going to do that. And you might as well go on and commit. And you know, y'all sit down so they can uh, find the seats. Amen. But, uh, but, um, but the beautiful thing, the beautiful thing is this thing is, is hitting. And look, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I got kids. I got grandkids. I, I like to have a good time. I like to have fun with my children. Good, good, clean fun. We don't celebrate witchcraft and witches and demons and devils. But. But I like to have fun with my kids, and I like to have memories with my kids. But this isn't a normal little deal here, and if the Holy Ghost wants to interrupt anything going on, like Halloween Tuesday night, he's welcome to do it. We'll figure out something for our children downstairs that is it's Holy Ghost, not, not, not haunted. And, and uh, we, will, we will just have a good time, but I just got a feeling that this is a divine setup. Even, even this week is a divine setup. Who's on the Lord's side? So praise the Lord. All right, it looks like it's looking good. You ready? Give him a big warm welcome, Evangelist Perry Stone.
know what a give it give it to the Lord. Come on, give it up for the King of Kings. Amen. For real. Uh, this is a this is a this is a great problem to have, and I'm so grateful. I can't. You can be seated. <laughs> you better you better be seated. Somebody take your seat from you. And you can see that can happen real quick. But uh, I'm, I, I'm excited. I concur with Pastor. Pastor is the, the bishop of this house, and we submit totally to him, even though we're best friends, and I'm older than him. <laughs> I'll always be older, won't I? That's depressing to think about, really. <laughs> but I submit to this great man of God, even though we're, we're like brothers, and I, I, I sense in my spirit we should go through Wednesday. And I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you one reason why. On Tuesday night, God gave me a message that is a mind blower that's called How Satan Selects His Victims. I'm going to preach it on Halloween night. I'm going to preach it on Halloween night. And it is, it will, if you, if you have four kids, have you ever noticed three are compliant and one is defiant? How come you always have one in the family that just, what's the deal? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what that, what that is. I'm going to tell you about it. But uh, we're going to get ready to get into the Word. Oh, my goodness. Hey, I feel the anointing. Uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I really, Jensen, I really didn't know at age 64 when I would have long revivals. You know, we have had long. You've had them, too, to go a couple weeks or whatever. I didn't know if I'd ever see this again because of the way the nation is and the way things are going. And then the Lord kept dealing with me about this Joel 2 thing. And I'm not going to say it, but what God showed you in Israel years ago. And I just knew it had to happen at some time. So I just want to say <laughs> to God that I'm just, I'm glad that he allowed this little preacher from Tennessee to come by at a time when he was ready to do something in this area and just to be a part. I'll never, I'm, I don't understand the ways of the Lord but I'm appreciative of it. Okay, I'm getting ready to preach. Charlie, did they move you? Where's Charlie? Okay, can we get a little camera on Charlie? Real quick, just so you'll know, if you're, if you're here, this is the prophetic summit with 13 messages. Jonathan Kahn, me, Mark Biltz, Lance Wallnow. That's one on the left. The other one is the main event. We just had it. And Jensen preached it, by the way. So Charlie has these on the table, and he's going to give you a deal for both of them. You want to get both of them. So uh, I want to say that. All right, now, let me tell you, you guys are in the spit section. <laughs> I hope you brought a towel. Because I have a tendency, I have a, a lot of young people in our meetings, and I have a tendency of getting excited. I told them, I said, I'm going to pick up one of them and body slam them if the anointing hits me. So <laughs> if there's any volunteers, just let me know. Make sure you're in good shape. No, I better make sure I'm in good shape if I'm going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm just kidding. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get into the word on the subject of how to prepare for what is coming. How to prepare for what is coming. I've been preaching for 47 years now, and I have, and this is not an exaggeration, 170,000 hours or longer of studying the Bible. That's all I do all day long, my staff will tell you. Sometimes it's been 10 to 15 hours a day, no joke. And I've studied it, what's left to be fulfilled. And there's only two things the church has assigned an assignment to do that's left, that remains, before the Lord returns and the dispensation of the grace of God ends and the tribulation starts. Number one is Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations. And then the end would come. And of course, if you keep reading in verse 15, he goes into the tribulation after the end comes. So what's the end? It's the end of the church age. It's the return of the Lord for the overcoming church. And then we go into the tribulation period. I'm a, I'm a pre-trib person, not that everybody agrees with me because they surely don't. But I've studied it enough to where I could believe I can prove what we believe. Second thing that has to happen, and this is where we're going to go tonight, is Acts chapter 2, 17 through 18. There must be a major global worldwide outpouring of the Holy Spirit on a scale that the world has never seen before. Amen? In Joel chapter 2, verses two, uh, 28 through 31, we're going to put these scriptures on the screen for all of you in here that can see this with uh, something I'm going to share with you. Joel chapter 2, 28 through 31. 
it shall come to pass afterwards. I want everybody to look at the word afterward because I'm going to show you something really bizarre in a moment that Peter quotes this exact passage I'm giving you in Acts 2, and he changes that word right there. And it's significant. And I never studied it from a scholar, but the Lord showed it to me one day, and we're going to go there in a moment. It'll come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And upon your servants and handmaidens in those days will I pour out of my spirit. Now the servants are men and the handmaids are the females. Let me just tell you, I don't understand why there are denominations that just think women can't do nothing but sit and listen to somebody preach. Because God said, when this outpouring comes, it's not going to be just a bunch of old men running around on the pulpit preaching and teaching and praying, but handmaidens, which are females and women of God, are going to be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit when this last day outpouring comes. It's right here in the book. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The blood, by the way, Rabbinically, the blood, the fire, and the pillars of smoke are volcanic eruptions. He says this, the sun will be turned to darkness. Those are solar eclipses that will occur on festival days, Jewish festivals. When they're not on a festival, they're not significant. When they fall on a festival, there is always wars that begin to break out in the world. I wish I had time to preach it. And the moon will turn to blood. These are called blood moons. It doesn't mean the moon's going to turn blood, drip blood, and blood go. You know, somebody said years ago, the Russians and the Americans are going to go to the moon. They're going to have a fight, and blood is going to be on the moon. Can you imagine that? You, there's no gravity up there like we have here. Can you imagine somebody taking a sword? <laughs> Slow motion. A moon, the moon turning into blood are lunar eclipses that happen on Jewish festivals. When solar signs, sun, moon, and stars, falling stars, comets, meteorites, asteroids, blood moons, when they happen on a Jewish festival day, history shows you there are major things that happen either to the Jewish people, in modern time, to Israel, to Jerusalem, wars or something significant happens, and God's cosmic signs reveal that. But here's the best part of this verse. All the things I just told you will happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. The great and terrible day of the Lord is a term used in Hebrew for what the New Testament calls the great tribulation. And the great tribulation, if it's a new term to you, is a term used where Daniel and John both talk about a beast, not an animal. But animal symbolism is used to describe the characteristics of this person. He is better known as the Antichrist. I personally believe he's alive on the planet somewhere. And he will form a 10 nation confederacy. I do believe, unlike some, that they are Islamic nations. I believe the Antichrist is a Muslim. I believe he comes out of the Middle East from the area of Syria and Iraq. And I guarantee you, I can prove it to you from the Bible if you'll give me two hours to preach, which I don't have tonight. But I've written books called Unleashing the Beast, and I've been on national television talking about this, and it's all there. Boy, I wish I had time to talk about that, but no, we won't be able to do that in this service. So before the tribulation comes, everything I just read to you and you saw on the screen is going to begin to unfold. However, I want, you to, I want to focus in a little tighter on some things. There are three realms prophetically that are going to begin to collide at one time that are all significant. And I'm telling you for the first time in my life, uh, 64 years and preaching 47 years, I can see it beginning to happen with what's about to take place in the nation of Israel and the nation's turning. Just a minute, I'm just getting a download from the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, give me a minute. Give me a minute. I'm going to have to go on a trail before, okay. Now, I may go longer than 35 minutes tonight. Do you mind? Because, because I've got, I've got, I'm getting downloads. There are scriptures in the Bible that say the Jews would return from the Gentile nations from the north and the south and the east. They've already come out of Russia over one, almost two million back to Israel. But it tells you they will come from the west. 
the West in the bi biblical times would have been predominantly what we term today Western Europe. However, the West today is Canada, America, and Mexico. And I said 20 years ago, you'll see a time in the United States when people in America will turn on Jews in Brooklyn, New York. And it will be Muslims that hate what they're doing in Israel. I said this 20 years ago, and the Holy Spirit wants me to remind you of this. And right now, a little Jewish boy in Brooklyn is playing, and a man walked up to him and said, you little Jew, I'm gonna cut you with a knife and cut your throat. The Jews, for the first time in American history, in Connecticut, in Vermont, and New York, and New Jersey, are terrified. I have friends that live up there because they say there are thousands and tens of thousands of people that want our death and want death to Jews and death to Israel. And I predicted it would either be econo economy, it would be a major terrorist attack, it would be a banking collapse, or it would be an uprising against Jewish people in America that will cause the Jews to say, we can't live here anymore, we're not safe, we have to go back to Israel. One way or the other, mark this down in the West. I'm not saying all of them, but many Jewish people will eventually make an exodus back to the Holy Land because you understand they're being surrounded by enemies. So God is going to bring more Jews to balance the enemies raising up against them. See, there's always a plan that God has behind it that's positive even when things look negative. All right, I, 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 want, to, I want to go on here because I have to stay focused. Okay, there's three areas, three arenas of prophecy. One, the arena of Israel. Number two, the arena of global alignment of nations. And number three, the arena of the gospel being preached around the world. And well, let me elaborate on these three for just a moment. Israel, as a, without a doubt, and you've heard it taught, is God's prophetic time clock. And every time in history there's ever been a war in Israel, it has transitioned into prophecy being fulfilled in some manner. Every war, 48, 56, 67, Yom Kippur in 73, they got the Bashan back, they got the West Bank back. Those are all prophetic places mentioned in the Bible that Israel would have to own when Jesus returns. So this war is about to become extremely prophetic. Why? Number two, because of global alignments. Now, Turkey, when I talk to, I'm going to go ahead and tell you who it was. It was many years ago, and it happened to be Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and a businesswoman from Massachusetts set me up with a private meeting with him. They, the security men locked the doors, and I sat down and was able to ask him questions. In fact, we videotaped it, Charlie, and we've never showed the videotape on television because it was that private. I said, Prime Minister, who is your greatest enemy in the Middle East as far as whom do you feel could become or is? I thought he would say Syria, Iraq, Iran. He listed none of them. As a matter of fact, he said, militarily, if we had to do it, we could take care of ourselves with any of those nations you just named. He said, but Turkey is a different story. They have the weapons, they have the ability, they have the connections to nuclear weapons. And he said, Turkey is the one we keep an eye on. Yesterday, the president of Turkey said, if Israel does not stop what they're doing in Gaza, I'm sending troops and declaring war on Israel. And they have the weapons to do damage. The Persians, which are the Iranians, the religious leaders, and not just the religious leaders, but the leaders of Hamas who are hiding out in the oil-rich Gulf states. Isn't it amazing? All these guys that run the terrorism are living like kings off of people's money while they're letting other people die. Come on, talk to me, somebody. But they met with Putin in Russia. Why is that significant? Because Persia is the leading nation in the biggest battle that preachers have been telling you about for 40 years called the War of Gog and Magog. To Garma in Ezekiel 38 is the, is the nation of Turkey. All you need now is Libya and Ethiopia 
to turn against the Jewish people and start talking about attacking. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I have the possibility of Ezekiel 38 and 39 happening. And I've told men and women for years, it's the only place in the Bible that mentions seven years of burning weapons, which is a seven-year peace treaty, which could be the D treaty of Daniel 927, which becomes the treaty of the Antichrist. I'm, I'm trying to tell you that's how close we are to all of this wrapping up that we've been preaching for all these years. Somebody give God a praise for the fact that we're living in the times. It's all happening. Now, the third thing is the gospel arena. The gospel must be preached around the world, <laughs> and then the end would come. But when this awakening, when this, when this gospel is preached around the world, something happens. Something is triggered. And I want to tell you something. This is not normal. What has happened this week does not happen in America normally. But Mississippi has a revival. Auburn University has a revival. 2,000 baptized in water. Somebody said to me, what on earth is happening? Asbury had a revival up in Kentucky. 40,000 people showed up. They had to shut the revival down because the town couldn't hold them. What is happening? Let me tell you what's happening. God is going to shake the earth one more time. Shake your heart one more time to get you ready for the last days for what is about to do and for the last day harvest because it's not God's will that anybody perish. So he's trying to get, young people, he's trying to get your attention while you're young. He's trying to get your attention right now. You're a part of, ah, Jesus, you're a part of what I'm about to tell you and you better be excited when you hear this in a minute. So what does God do? He sends three things. Revival or an awakening, or an outpouring. Sometimes they're all combined, but many times they are three different things. A revival is to revive the people of God, to take the lukewarmness out, to take the carnality out, to bring them back into a full relationship with him. Awakenings don't just happen to individuals, but awakenings happen to entire regions. As a matter of fact, the Great Awakening in America happened in the state of Massachusetts many years ago, and 50,000 people were converted over that during that one awakening with Jonathan Edwards. The third thing is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and outpourings not only happen in areas or regions, but they will happen, according to the final one, globally, on all flesh around the world at one time. When they happen, there is a renewing of spiritual gifts, there is a renewing of faith, and there is a joy. Did you know the Bible says in Samaria when revival broke out, there was great joy in the city. When revival breaks out in Gainesville, it becomes the talk of the town. And people aren't biting, backbiting and criticizing and complaining. They're talking about what God is doing. When God shows up in a town, there will be great joy in the city, according to Acts chapter 8. There have been, in the Bible, there were five revivals under Hezekiah, Josiah, and Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, revive thy works in the midst of the year. Under Elijah in Samaria, five revivals broke out. In the Bible, one major awakening occurred. It was the city of Nineveh. The entire city repented. The whole city was awakened. Scholars say there was about 150,000 people living back then in that city. There was one major outpouring. It was the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 where 120 were filled with the Spirit before the day was over, 3,000 were saved before the week was over, 5,000 more were saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 4, Acts chapter 10, 45, Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7. God began to pour out His Spirit in the first century church, but one major outpouring hit at one time and one place and went from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and around the world. Let's talk about America because that's where we're from. In the United States of America, my research indicates that since the time of World War I, actually prior to World War I, let's say for the past 120 years, that revival comes about every 20 years on a cycle. We call it a revival cycle. Now, they come in regions. They come in areas. For example, Brownsville was a revival that came to Pensacola. So people came to Pensacola to be a part of the revival. There have been other revivals break out over the years. But about every 20 years, there'll be a great move of God somewhere. There have been 
five awakenings in the history of the United States. Some are very large, some are lesser known, some are in history, some are not. In the United States, there have been four outpourings. I'm gonna give you the history of these four outpourings of the Holy Spirit. 1898 in Murphy, North Carolina, in that region. 1900 in Kansas City. 1906 at Azusa Street. 1967 during what was called the Charismatic Renewal. 1898 was the birth of Zionism, which led to the reestablishment of Israel as a nation 50 years later. 1900 is a very interesting date, but what is more interesting than 1900 was you had the East Coast first, the Midwest second, then you had the West Coast in 1906. Now, I'm going to tell you what triggered the Azusa Street Revival. You all ready for this? And I found this out when I walked into a bookstore and pulled a book out that was written after a major earthquake took place called the San Francisco Earthquake. April of 1906, San Francisco shook to the ground. Thousands of people were killed. Gas lines busted. The city burnt. And the word was out. I don't know if you know this, Pastor. The word was out that the next city to be destroyed would be Los Angeles, California. Because they realized there were fault lines in California. And in California, in 1906, a black preacher named Seymour started preaching at a house. And they got to shouting and the house, the, the porch fell in. And they had to go to a livery stable and they started a revival that actually went on not seven years. It went on 15 years. And it was called the Azusa Street Revival. And thousands and hundreds of thousands of people came to that revival, were filled with the Spirit, many saved, and missionaries went around the world. But that revival was triggered by the fact that Los Angeles was terrified that they were next. So here's what I'm going to say. History indicates that most awakenings, most revivals, and even outpourings come in the midst of a nation or an area or a city where great fear has come of what's about to happen. So why is America stirred right now spiritually? Because they saw a war with Russia and Ukraine. Because they saw the possibility of China attacking Taiwan. Because they saw Israel and what happened to the Israeli people. And now what's happening in the Gaza Strip. Listen to me very carefully. I want, I want to make this very clear. Practically every revival comes during either an economic, social, political, or military crisis. And many come, and I feel the anointing with what I'm about to tell you. I can sense it building. Many come before a major war happens that affects the nation. Mm. The Great Awakening preceded the Revolutionary War that the United States encountered. A Great Awakening, believe it or not, preceded the Civil War, and you don't get this in history unless you study the right history. Both the Northern Armies and the Southern Armies were baptizing their soldiers, singing hymns, and having revival in all of the camps because the boys knew they could die in the war. That's in history. We were a divided nation in this civil war. 620,000 were killed, but 300,000 soldiers converted to the Lord during the time of the civil war. When they died, they would have gone into the kingdom because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. One of the great awakenings, even the Azusa Street, lasted up until the edge of World War I. In 1948, at the end of World War I, came the healing revival. There was a great awakening called the Charismatic Movement after the Six-Day War of June of 1967, where Israel got the Sinai back, they got Jerusalem back and reunited it as the capital. They got the West Bank back, which today is in the hands of the Palestinian authorities. Israel still oversees it. They got the Bashan back or the Golan Heights, which also is a part of prophecy, which was owned by Syria. And they still have possession of that with military bases today. And that's why Hezbollah is shooting missiles there because Syria wants that territory back. So I'm trying to say this to you. Please listen to me. Why does God begin to send awakenings and revivals to a nation. And please hear me because he told me this. 
I said, Lord, why do you do it? And why does it seem to happen before a major crisis, before a war breaks out? And he said, because I want men who are going to battle to hear the gospel so that if they die in war, they don't die lost. Oh, wow. Oh, God goes to the extreme to make sure you have a seed in you that when you get in trouble, that seed of the word, the gospel, who Jesus is, he's the son of God, he's the savior, that it stirs back up in you all of a sudden. So his interest is souls and harvest. So he knows the bad that's coming. He knows the death that could happen. He knows the crisis that's coming. He knows COVID was coming. He knows plagues are coming, Matthew 24. So what does he do? He stirs the people up with the preaching of the word so the seed will at least be in their heart. So if they should pass or if they get in a crisis knowing they're near eternity, they would suddenly turn their hearts back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, mm, I've got to show you something. I want you gentlemen to bring up again Joel chapter 2, uh, the verse that I had in the beginning, 28, 29, right in there. And let's read this. And then in a minute, we're going to go to Acts 2, 17. But first, let's go to Joel. Everybody say this. Read this with me. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Okay, let's hold it right there. Now let's flip it over to the New Testament because when the spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost, filled 120 in the upper room, Peter came forward in front of all those Jewish people. It was a festival. It was packed with Jews and he preaches they're saying, what is this? What meaneth this? What is this thing that's happening there? Are they drunk? Peter says this in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Here's what he does. He quotes the book of Joel. He quotes this prophecy almost verbatim. And it shall come to pass, read it with me, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men will see dream dreams. Can anybody tell me what word Peter changed? Afterwards. Now, he almost quotes it word for word, and it's recorded word for word. So I'm saying, wait a minute. Why does he say last days? All right, let me take you now that verse from a more liberal theological interpretation of maybe a, a, a minister who went to a theological school that does not believe in the Holy Spirit being poured out today. We read that verse as full gospel people and say, God's going to pour out his spirit Upon all flesh, because the Bible says so. So we look forward to what? A revival. We look forward to an outpouring based on the verse. But another minister will take Acts 2 and say this, folks. <laughs> these crazy people who are telling you that a revival's coming and the Holy Spirit's being poured out. Don't you know what Peter said? Peter said in the last days, God would pour out his spirit. But that's not, the, that's, that's, uh, that's not our time. The last days were in Peter's time because Jesus had told him that Jerusalem would be destroyed, that the Jews would be scattered. He did in Matthew 23 tell him that, didn't he? So in other words, the last days that Peter spoke of where the Holy Spirit would come, was the last days of the apostles. So there is no Holy Spirit poured out. There is no tongues today. There are no miracles happening because it all happened in the last days. Now, if you take what Peter said, that preacher just told you the truth. Do you know that? Because Peter said it'll come to pass in the last days, and he was talking to the Jews that the last days are on us, not the last days of Jesus coming back, but the last days for Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jews. Matthew 23, Jesus said this, upon you shall come the blood 
of all the righteous people from Abel to Zechariah, whom you slew between the porch of the altar, and it'll happen in one generation. Jesus had told him in one. So Jesus is saying this in 30 AD and in 70 AD, bam, the Romans came in, burned the temple to the ground, killed the Jews, take the Jews captive, destroy Jerusalem, take the city over, end of Israel, end of Jerusalem, end of the Jews. 40 years is one generation. Talk to me, somebody. So Peter was right. But that same preacher mm -mm, is going to have a problem if he goes to Joel 2. Because there was a reason Peter changed the word afterward to last days. Because he knew Jerusalem had 40 years left because 40 years was a generation. So he's telling them, you're seeing the outpouring before the destruction comes. But let's go back to Joel, guys, in Joel 2. Well, well, well. Dear preacher, it'll come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and stop. Go down there to verse 29. I think it is, maybe it's 30. And it says this, and all of this will happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's the tribulation. That has not yet happened. Let me, let me just break it down where you can understand it. If you want to know when Joel said, now it will come to pass afterwards, you got to read what he said before he said that verse. And if you go, what, <laughs> go to Joel 1, and he's talking about a great army that would come and how there would be smoke and destruction with this great army. Then you come in chapter two, and he says, but wait a minute. In fact, he says in chapter one, but God is gonna restore to Israel the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. And he said, your barns shall be full of wine and your, 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 your barns will be full of grain and you're filled with vineyards. And he's talking about when Israel gets restored as a nation in the latter days. That did not happen at Pentecost. The disciples asked him, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1, 7. He said, it's not for you to know the times which the Father has put in his own power, but you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. They're wanting to know when will this kingdom be restored. It was never restored in Peter's day. It was never restored to the destruction of the temple. Israel was restored in 1948. 1,948 years after the birth of Jesus, Israel is restored as a nation. Now, when that happens, the land is restored, the farms are restored, the agriculture is restored. God takes all that swamp land, turns it into farmland. God takes all that desert, makes it blossom like a rose, according to the Bible. Now, that's when Joel said, now, afterward, God will pour out his spirit. So here's the meaning. The generation that starts seeing Israel restored as a nation, the generation that sees Jerusalem restored as the capital of Israel will be the generation that will have the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so here's the deal. There were two outpourings. You want to prove it? Go to James 5. The husbandman waits patiently for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it till he gets the early rain and the latter rain. Pentecost was the first rain. See, let me, okay, so go, you're getting ahead of yourself, Perry. Okay, go back. Okay, let's go back. Let me just say it this way, that if you go into Israel, you'll discover they have two rain periods. One of them is a, one of them is a late fall rain coming into the winter, and one is a spring rain. The first rain 
rain gets the soil loosened to put the seed in, but the second rain is what makes the harvest and the crops grow. There has to be two outpourings. Listen to me, excuse me, dead preacher. There was not just one outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. There had to be one because that's the early rain. But Mr. Preacher, if you read the rest of the Bible and not eliminate the rest of it, you'll discover there's a second rain and that's called the latter rain. So Peter did the first rain, talked about the first rain. Joel talked about the latter rain. So there's coming a latter rain. What does that mean? That means there is going to be a revival. That means there is going to be an outpouring. That means God's going to pour his spirit on all flesh. Oh, come on, somebody in the house. Help me praise the king of glory right now. Glory to God. My Lord. Now, here's the thing I have to tell you, and please hear this. I have to tell you that this outpouring is clearly before the great day of the Lord. These blood moons that already happened on festival days have already happened, and they happened before the tribulation. These lunar eclipses happening on festival days are already happening, and they're happening before the seven-year great tribulation. The, a few months ago, 47 volcanoes were either erupting or cracking in the earth going off. 47 blood, fire, pillars of smoke, sun to darkness, moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So before the tribulation comes, this is good news. You know, we ought to be hooping and hollering. I started to say swinging from the chandeliers, but that'd be a real lucky one if somebody could do that. <laughs> Honey, if you, got, if, you could, if you guys can jump that high, I will call my NBA guy and hire you. You'll be in the NBA tomorrow. You understand? You get to whatever money you... But, I, but let me just say, we ought to be hanging off the rafters when we think about what I'm telling you. That you and I... It's not all going to be bad. See, we, we, we preach about the last days and everything looks so bleak and so bad. There's two tracks going on here. There's this really doom and gloom and tribulation and war track. Then there's this gospel being preached, Holy Ghost pouring out, joy of the Lord. The joy is my strength. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Hey, there's two tracks going on here. And so what I want you to understand, and you got to re- I want you to really gra- grasp this, is the sign, one of the signs that we're going to be into it is the very first part of this verse. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters. That's this generation right here. See everybody and, and the rest of them out there. See all these young people over here? See all this, let me get let me get them on camera so you can see. See all these young people sitting up here. Look, look at them. See them. See them. You know why you all need to be excited. First of all, I know the enemy's after you. There's gender confusion. There's same-sex relationships. The enemy's trying to kill your identity. He's trying to confuse you over who you are. He's trying to wreck the image of God in you. And the only reason he's really messing so bad with all the young people in the United States and the world with this generation, are you ready for me to tell you why he's really messed up right now and coming after you? He's coming after you because you're the only generation in history of young people that have a promise of God hanging over your head. You got a promise. God said you are going to prophesy. You are going to preach. You're going to have an outpouring. God's going to pour the Holy Spirit out all over. The women, they have a promise, and the enemy wants to stop it. But I got news for the devil. Too bad, so sad. You have never been able to stop one promise that God gave in his word, and you're not stopping this one. She couple hold on. Give the Lord the best shout you've given him in this. Your pastor was an evangelist and he would go places and have extended revivals. I have been an evangelist my entire life and have had extended revivals. Not, a, not, not as many now as we used to have, but the, la- the two of the last revivals I had that were extended was right here at Free Chapel, up there at the old church, we went five weeks. Hey, was anybody in that one? Yeah. Raise your hand if you were in that one. That was a great one. North Cleveland Church of God, 
right after that, five weeks. And then I started going mostly to weekends because of my scheduling. But can I tell you something? Every revival, the fall of Tennessee went 11 weeks every night. That's how I felt. I had to call in a young preacher called Joel Talley and say, I'm going to preach and sit down and you got to lay hands on everybody. And Joel had to pray for people because I was wore out 11 weeks because I'd already preached five weeks, making it a total of 16 weeks every night. And they said, the revival's got to go on. I said, it could go on without me because I'm going to Florida and lay on a beach. <laughs> so I think Pam and I went to, we went somewhere, didn't we, baby? I, I, because my body could take, not take it physically anymore. All right. Every revival started with young people. Now, I want y'all to young people, in the next couple of days, I want y'all to do something. And I'm going to explain why. In Pulaski, Virginia, on a Sunday night, we had a crowd of young people. And I said, I want you to go. And I want you to get in your school. And I want you to literally bug the daylights out of every kid you know. And say... I want you to come to church with me. I don't care. If they go to another church, say, hey, we take, we're not taking, listen, I want you to understand something. We're not taking people out of churches. This is not about trying to make free, free chapels been growing. This is not about that. This is about getting people on fire for God out of every church, okay? It's not about one group. You need to know that. We want you to go back to your church and set it on fire. Pastor wants that. This is not about taking in, you know, as, you know, if you, if you know, if you come here, fine, but if you have another church, you need to be, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to bug them till you get them here. I don't even know if I should go here. Cause I know people are going to think I've lost my mind. Okay. Here's, here's what happened. The young people said, is there anything we can do to get him there? I said, <clears throat> I said, don't tell nobody we're going to do this. But I said, bring candy. Now, don't give peanuts to somebody that's got a problem. You understand? Choke them to death. But bring candy. If they like candy, suckers, lollipops, whatever, and pray over and ask God to convict them when they eat it. And the kids went nuts. They said, we feel like James Bond, man. With, we got some kind of weapon on us going. And we would pray over stuff and say, convict them. I'm telling you the God's truth. And when those kids would start doing this, they'd say, come to church with me. They'd say, Okay. Let me tell you what happened on a Sunday night. Pulaski County High School, Pulaski, Virginia. I looked up and we counted 450 kids from one high school. God, I feel the anointing. And I said, you know what? We're going to lay hands on all of it. And we formed a prayer line that wrapped around the church, down the aisles, and down the hall. This is the God's truth. And when we started laying hands on young people, the power of God came on them, and all of them fell out under the power of the, all of them. Some of them said, I don't believe in all that. Bam. That's crazy. Bam. And some of them shook and could not get up off the floor till they repented. And there are young people today preaching the gospel, pastoring churches, and young women married to preachers who laid on that floor in a Sunday night revival in Pulaski, Virginia. God will pour out his spirit on your sons. Listen to this. William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army, started preaching in London slums. When he was 15, Charles Spurgeon at 19 years of age from 19 to 30 formed a 5,000 seat auditorium in London and packed it out and was called the greatest preacher of the century. Jonathan Edwards at age 13 entered Yale in 1716. At age 21, he pastored a church and started the great awakening that shook the whole Northeastern part of the United States. Amy Carmichael was 28. She left for India. She served 56 years in India without a furlough in a very dangerous area. Great missionary. David Brainers was a missionary to the Indians at age 84. Five years before his death, they printed his diary, which is a classic. George Williams in 1844 was a 23-year-old 23 year old businessman and started something called the YMCA as a business outreach for businessmen. Another man by the name of John Wesley 
was 26 years of age and started the Holy Club, that was the name of it, at Oxford University, and was the man that led the revival in America and England. George Whitfield was 20 years of age, a member of John Wesley's Holy Club, and in 1730, by age 25, had won 30,000 people in America. Phyllis Whitley was a precious black slave girl, and in 1770, at 17 years of age, she wrote a poem that got her global fame at age 17, a little slave girl. Can I tell you something? You see that young man right there? Young. Jensen Franklin. I called you a young man. You can thank me later. <laughs> you see Perry Stone? Marcus Lamb? How many know Daystar Network, Marcus and Joni? Marcus went to be with the Lord. And there's another pastor, you probably never heard of him, but he pastored a great church uh, years ago in Tampa, Florida. His name was Randy White. Let me tell you something about all four of us. All four of us got called to preach as teenagers. And you know how we got, do you know how we got called to preach in meetings just like this? It was the anointing of God that came on us and we would fall under the power of God or we'd kneel down and we'd get to pray and we'd pray an hour or two and couldn't get up. Every one of us were called to preach as, as just as teenagers. Jensen called me years ago and he said, Perry, I don't want my children to grow up not knowing and feeling what we felt in those old camp meetings and those youth camps that changed our lives. I would, would have never known when Pam and I were married and I go to Gastonia, North Carolina for revival. I saw a young, very thin, dark-haired young man playing a saxophone with his brother Richie playing a trumpet. And I said to Pam, I have no idea who that kid is. I'm a kid myself. I'm 23 calling him a kid. <laughs> but that, God's hands on him like big time. And Jensen sat. They, they preached some, I think. We were there three weeks. But he sat under my ministry way back then. That was before he was ever married. We would have never known in one million years. <laughs> Traveling to these little churches that sometimes they were so poor we gave the offering back to them. You did it and I did it. I felt more sorry for them than I did myself. <laughs> little churches with 20 and 30 people there. But you know what we were? Faithful to what God told us. Not complaining. We kept on. And now God's given both of us an absolute worldwide ministry. And Brother Marcus, as you know, started Daystar, which is the, the, actually the fastest growing network probably in the world, Christian network. Why am I telling you that? Because you never know, sitting on this platform, if the next Billy Graham or the next Joyce Meyer or the next Carrie Job. I've got to tell a story in closing. And we're going to pray. We are going to pray in a minute. You all, get, you all need to get ready. We're going to pray. In a, we're going, uh, there's a prayer meeting about to break out in this place. Many years ago, it will have been. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. 14 years ago. At the Voice of Evangelism offices, I'm sitting in my upstairs office and I'm just typing. Actually, I was probably, I was writing a message or a book. I don't remember which one. And I stopped and said, Lord, just real, real simple. What would you have me to do the next, oh, 10 or 20 years if you tarry? And I was just asking him and I went back to typing and I heard him say, do you want to go where I'm going? I heard him say it and I went, whoa, whoa. That was the Lord. That wasn't me. That come out of my spirit into my head. That wasn't me. And I sat back and I got real quiet. And I said, yes, Lord. <laughs> and he said, my last move will be on the sons and the daughters. And I said, but God, I, I, you know, they know me as a prophecy preacher. And I'm out preaching revivals. What am I supposed to do? And he spoke to me and he said, you build me a gathering place for a generation. And I didn't know what it looked like. And he said, I want you to help father a generation that has no spiritual fathers. Well, 
I got overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. There was a young man in our town named Mark Casto who worked with Dr. T.L. Lowry. Dr. T.L. Lowry had a building on a hill, and Mark was having what's called extreme services. He just called it the extreme, and he would have sometimes 10 young people, 15, 20, 25 young people there. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to go see Mark because I didn't know what I was doing. I showed up one night, and I showed up at that place, and I went to the back room where some of them had been praying, and I sat in the chair. And when Mark cast out, I didn't know Mark. I just knew he worked for Dr. Lowry. We'd never had a meal together or a conversation. And we looked up, he said, Perry Stone, what are you doing here? I said, I need to tell you something. And he dismissed his youth, and there were two other men in there. Is Ricky here tonight? Ricky Shapiro, are you here, Ricky? In Time News. Where are you at, Ricky? Ricky, they're over in Time News. A great, great group. A lot of you know Ricky. Ricky, were you in the room that night? That was before you got there. Okay. And I told him what God told me, and he started crying. He said, Jason, it was Jason. He said, Jason, come here. He said, come here, Jason. He said, tell Perry Stone what I told you. No, you got to understand, I never talked to this kid. Never talked to Mark, just knew who he was. He said, well, Perry, good to meet you. I've never met you. You've heard about you. He said, but Mark Casto has been on a fast, and he's been fasting 21 days because God told him to fast for you, for God to speak to your heart to father a generation. I got blown away. I said, Mark, what am I supposed to do? He said, I don't know. Come out and hang with. So I'd come in on Thursdays and just hang out. Then he asked me to preach. So we announced it and had 60 young people show up. Now, Jensen, this happened before God. Before God in heaven, this happened. As we are preaching that night, I'm preaching that night, 60 young people there in that place. I said, there are five of you, not six, not eight, not three. There are five of you called to missionary work. You know it, and you even know where you're going. You know that God has spoke to you, the country. Come up here. And exactly five young people came forward. Now, what I'm going to tell you blew my mind and theirs. I said, line up. I went to the first one and laid my hands on them and began to pray in an Indian dialect. It sounded like a Cherokee Indian talking. And I did not know her daddy was in the back and he ministered with Indians in New Mexico, the, the tribal people. And I was, I was speaking in Navajo, was it? I think it was Navajo. And I was sing, singing a Navajo song over his daughter who was called to the Indian nations in tongues, the Holy Spirit, not me. I went to the second one and it sounded like Japanese or Chinese. It had that Asian sound. And her best friend starts screaming in the middle of this. I'm mean, just, ah, ah. And I was speaking the Mandarin Chinese language over her. And she had told her friend that day, I'm called to go to China. The next one was Portuguese. I, I spoke fluent Portuguese over the third young person. And they had just came back from Portugal and understood what I was saying. God spoke in the five different languages where the five different people were called to be missionaries. And then when I finished, I mean, the glory hit, everybody's crying, and I turned to Mark. This is so crazy. This is just Perry Stone. I said, Mark, I'm hungry. I'm leaving here. Take it. <laughs> and walked out the door. And he said, I didn't know what to do with it. But he said, God confirmed you were the man to help do what we were going to do. Now, let me tell you the rest of the story. It was during that time. <laughs> Y'all, excuse me, man. This is, this is going to mess me up tonight. Not in a bad way. I wish some. Uh, did I bring a hanky, honey? Here, hang on. I got to have a. I was going to bark from somebody, and I'll blow my nose. You can sell it on eBay. I'll sign it for you. So <laughs> people, do, people do crazy stuff like that. I don't know. I have to get humorous to keep from just, just totally breaking down. That's why I do that sometimes. So stay with me for a few moments because this is real important. So my son was addicted to alcohol and drugs, and we couldn't get him off of him. Jensen, three times, he said, I'm going to go to Jensen's place, and he'd wake up the next morning and change his mind. 
Twice we almost beat the door down because we thought he'd overdosed and died on us. He'd ended up in a hospital one time, and I'm not embarrassing my boy. He, he lets me tell the testimony. He took 70 pills and was almost dead. He almost died with 70 pills, and the doctor gave him a device and said, if you feel a heart attack coming and your heart quit, press that, but I can't promise to bring you back. You know what it's like? When you got a boy that took 70 pills and the doctor said he might die on you because 16 kids died doing the same thing that month. He tells me that. And your son says, Daddy, I didn't take these pills to kill myself. I was just trying to get high. He said, Dad, I really don't want to die tonight. You got to pray that I won't die, Daddy. <laughs> and I felt as helpless. As a little rat running around looking for food, man, I felt helpless. I said, God, if my, what if something happens to my boy and I can't pray him back? And man, something come on me. Later that night, they put him in a room and I told the nurse, everybody at the hospital knew me because I'm from town there. I said, I'm going to tell you all something. We're paying for this room, right? Yes, sir. You have to pay for the room. He said, I'm laying down beside my son. Shut the door and don't bother me. Yes, sir, preacher. <laughs> now, you don't do that in a hospital. You don't lay down beside the person in the bed. You know what I'm saying? And I laid down beside him, and I stayed there and prayed over him till he went to sleep. And I said to Satan, I will make you pay. <laughs> you are going to wish you never touched my boy. You hear me? I don't know what I'm going to do, devil, but you listen. Somewhere I'm going to make you pay for this. It won't be me and my strength. It won't be me. But you're going to pay for trying to kill my baby. And I didn't even know what I was saying. And then God speaks to me. He says, now build a gathering place for a generation. So I looked for property. This is after this. Found 16 acres and went to buy it. And right before I went to buy it, God told me, said, don't buy it. It's too small. I said, well, why didn't you tell me that before? He said, because you was in too much of a hurry to buy it. You weren't listening to me. So I found 100 acres. Now, it was owned by really, this, this is a Baptist brother. Now, I'm going to tell you what he calls himself. I don't call him this, but he calls himself a cousin Baptist. That's what he calls himself, Steve Williams. And his, he, he's married to a Pentecostal wife, and he's one of the need, he's just He is just one sweet guy. And he says, now, let me tell you something, preach. He got sunglasses on. I, I saw his, his property was behind me. It was about 100 acres. And I said, Steve, I'd like to buy this from you. He said, it's my boy's favorite property. Don't know I'm interested in selling it. And I got news for you. If you're going to build another church up here, we got 380 in the county, and that's one too many. I said, he said, what's it for? I said, well, honestly, Steve, God told me to build a bathroom place for a generation of young people. And that little Baptist guy did this. Oh, God, are you serious? <laughs> And I said, yeah, I'm serious. He said, you really, tell me about it. And I said, I told him about my son. I told him Satan was going to pay. I said, I'm going to build a gathering place for a generation. He said, oh God, I'm afraid I'm going to have to sell it to you. And I said, why? I said, why? He said, because the Lord talked to me a long time ago and told me it would be for young people. And now we're good friends. I said, well, lo and behold, God does talk to Baptist people. Look at you, Steve. I'm proud of you. <laughs> he said, let me pray about it. I said, you sure can. So he went home praying. and he did Bible roulette. He said, now, Lord, this is how Steve talked. Now, God, I want to ask you something. I like that property. But if you want me to sell it to Peristone, you better show me in the book. You better show me in the Bible. I'm open that Bible. He opened the Bible and it fell to that verse. No man has forsaken houses and lands, but in this life will not get a... He said, oh God, I got to sell it to him. He's forsaken the land, dear Lord. I got to sell that property to that boy. We bought the property in a recession. It's going to cost me $18 million to build the building, $22 million with everything in it, and no bank would give me a loan. And I said, now, God, what do I do? You told me to build it. And I started building it knowing I only had $4 million. And our young people would raise their hand. Give us a million. Give us, nobody ever give me a million. You teased me one time about a million-dollar donation. I'm going to go into that. It was really funny. Jess, Jensen was talking about a million-dollar donation. And he said, Perry, you haven't got one yet. What's the matter with you? And he said, are you living right, Perry? Are you living right? <laughs> you remember that? I said, Jensen Franklin. And so 
we, we ended up getting a $1 million donation. And I called Jensen first. Hey, Pastor, you ain't gonna believe this. And then a three million one came in. And then a two million one came in. And guess who I called first? I called Jensen. I said, something must be right around here, Jensen. Look at what God. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Then we built this building and it was built debt free. A millionaire that is not even a professed Christian gave me $14 million and paid the building off. And I remember riding with Jensen. I said, Jensen, I'm about to do something that I don't know how to do this, man. He, I said, you, you've done it. You're successful. I said, but the Lord's told me to have a youth meeting, and I don't even know how to do that. I do prophecy conferences. I, do, I preach in revivals. And he said, well, I know, you know you're not recognized as somebody with youth, but God can still help you. He said, you wouldn't recognize as prophecy, but he said, God can help you. He said, pray about it. And I called Karen Wheaton, who's... Nothing but young people. I said, Karen, I want to do a youth meeting, but I don't even know if they'll come. Huh. God told me to build this building. How much should I expect? She said, well, it's your first one. You've never done it. Expect, if you have 500, Perry, that's a good number. Honestly, she said, I had only 100 the first time I did one. So I'm expecting 500 to show up, right? So we announced Warrior Fest, where lambs become lions. Right? Youth event. Harry Stone, the prophecy guy. Going to do youth. Really? Okay. <laughs> Didn't know what to expect, Pastor. And I caught, guess who I called after the event? This man right here. Guess how many kids showed up to the very first youth event in the building God told me to build for a generation? 4,000 young people. <laughs> Not 400. And the next year, there were 5,000. And the next year, there were 6,000. And during COVID, 16,000 young people were scheduled to come to Warrior Fest. But I just want to tell you something. To God be the glory. When I stood on that platform and I saw all those young people, and every time I see them, and we're going to have another one in April, and every time I see them, and there's no chairs there because we can't put chairs in, they sit on the floor just like this young people. But every time I see them, and I'll see an altar call, and a 1,000 people are getting saved, and 700 one night got the Holy Ghost in one service. I walk around and said, told you, devil. Told you, didn't I? Going to make you pay. Told you. You touched my boy. And you keep messing with this generation. And we'll do something else to win them. Hallelujah. Glory to the king. Prepare the way of the Lord for the end time move of God. Now, I want to do something, and the Lord told me we would do this tonight. And I didn't know there'd be this many young people here, but this isn't all of them. This is only a small group. At a warrior fest on a Saturday night, over a thousand young people were just all over the place to receive the Holy Ghost, and I saw something I've never seen. And it blew my mind. We told them how to receive. We began to pray. The people began to pray. And when the power of God fell like Pentecost, 700 young people without anybody laying hands on them fell out under the power and start speaking in tongues at one time. That's called an outpouring. That's my point. Now, raise your hands all over this building and begin to bless the Lord. If you're saved, would you do that? If you're a born again believer, uh, I don't know what God's going to do tonight, but let's bless him. Let's bless him. Young people, get your heart ready. You're going to be the ones we're going to pray for in just a minute. Plus many others, Lord, Lord, in Jesus name, many of the, many of these are going to receive tonight. I know it because you told me Many in the congregation are going to receive tonight. I know because you told me. Most of all, God, your word tells me. That's what I lay. That's what I lean on, is what you say. Uh, now, sons and daughters, sons and daughters, every young person, if you're teenage, college age, let's stick with that. Let's stick with that age time frame, and all of you are that part. We're going to pray for God to fill you with the Spirit, based on Joel chapter two. And all you have to do is know you're born again and you're saved by the blood of Jesus. 
In Acts chapter 2, they were in covenant with, the Jesus, with Jesus, but the Holy Spirit was a second, second experience. Acts 10, 45, Acts 19, all of those, they, were, they believed in Jesus. It was a separate experience. Now, you're all born of the Spirit. Don't get me wrong. If you're saved, you're already born of the Spirit, but the baptism is God's power and anointing living inside of your spirit. It's another level for you, right? On the count of three, every young person, and I know there's going to be a crowd, but listen to how I want you to do this. Instead of bunching up, form one line shoulder to shoulder. Leave a little bit of space, form a second line shoulder to shoulder. Leave a little bit of space. So in other words, instead of bunching up like you are now, form lines. Everybody, you say, well, P Perry, I am filled. All right, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit now, that's fine. If you need to be refilled or you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I want all of you on the platform to, to, to start lining up down here. And then all of you in the audience in the balcony on the count of three, this is young people, this is college age, young people, teenagers. And I'm gonna tell you something, we're gonna pray for kids that are like 11. Remember when Drake got filled with the Holy Spirit right there sitting in the seat? Remember that? Right here in a revival. All the kids 12, 13, 14, that are not, let's say, late teens like these, you come to, are you ready? On the count of three, I want you to get down here. Oh, they're coming already. One, two, three. Oh, Lord, look at this. I didn't know there was that many here. Oh, my, oh, my. Pastor, look. This is, a, oh, my. Oh, <laughs> oh, la dee dee be hey, shay. I feel something going to happen. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, la la ba ra ba, shakariya. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Father. God, I praise you. 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 All right, when this fills up, just on the edges here, on the perimeters here, if you can kind of keep a straight line, that would be the best thing because we might try to get up there where you're at in a minute. I... <laughs> This looks, this looks like that warrior fest night, Jensen. Now, young people, all of you look this way. This is your moment. This is your season. This is why you've been fought the way you have with temptation and tests and drugs and alcohol. And I could name 10 other things. This is why you're fought because God has a promise hanging over you. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do exactly what I would do in one of my meetings with young people. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of receiving the Holy Spirit, just like we would do it if it was just a regular, like if this was a forward conference or one of our meetings. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I want you to pray it out loud. And then I'm going to say, receive the Holy Spirit, and I want you to let the Holy Spirit come on you. And what will happen is God will give you a prayer language. It'll start inside. It, sometimes it's just, a, it's just a word or two. It's not like a big language, like speaking Spanish or speaking Chinese. It just starts out a word or two, and God's going to give it to you. And the moment he gives you that phrase and that word to speak, speak it. I know a guy that said one word in tongues his whole life from Northport, Alabama, and it always bothered him. And I went to Israel for the first time and went to the Western Wall, and I heard a Jew saying that word while he was praying. <laughs> And it was holy, holy, holy. That's what that man said in the Holy Spirit. When God filled him, all he would say, holy, 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 holy. Amen. If the power of God comes on you real strong, we don't want you to fall back because, you know, there's a crowd here. And sometimes you get overwhelmed by the Lord. You've had it happen. But go down on your knees and, and keep praying. And if you want to go down on your knees after we pray the first prayer and pray. But everybody, turn your faith loose. This is God's will. God wants to do it. Don't doubt it all. Are you ready? Everybody ready? Everybody, in the, what about over here? Everybody ready over here? What about here? What about over here? Everybody ready over here? All right. Now, moms and dads, it's up to you not to watch, but to point your hand toward these kids in a minute when I get through praying, and you pray the fire of God down. Up in the, there ought to be enough faith in this place for everybody in this building to be baptized in the Holy Ghost in a few minutes. Everybody raise your hands. Young people, raise your hands right now. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I'm ready to receive more of you. I'm saved. I'm clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, I can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
God, I ask you right now, take the Holy Spirit, take his power, put it in my spirit, baptize me, fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak through me in the prayer language that you want me to pray in. You said you would do it. We believe it tonight. Say this, come in now. Come in now, Lord. Can you feel that? Oh, she, he, oh, 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 oh. Ha <laughs> Oh, Namanda Yasi Koya, la 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 Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy S come on, it may take five or ten minutes to break through, but go ahead and keep pressing. Moms and dads, pray out loud all over this. Lift your voice, moms and dads, three times as loud. Come on. Come on, they're starting to receive the Holy Spirit. Everybody pray louder. Hey, hey, da ba da 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 ma. Oh, oh, oh. In the aisle, obey God now. Feel, 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 feel. Receive in Jesus' name the Holy Spirit now. Right now in the name of Jesus. Receive, receive the power of God now in the name of Jesus. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Young people, come on, break through. Keep breaking through.
Why don't everybody on the perimeter start praying out loud? All you adults, close your eyes and pray. They need to hear you praying. They need to hear your words praying for them. God, fill them, fill them, fill them, Lord. If you want to kneel down, kneel down right where you are, young people. Somebody key. Hey, 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 hey. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, reach out there and pray for one of the young people beside you right now. Woo! God's Spirit is in the house. God's Spirit is here to fill. Hallelujah! Yeah, 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 yeah. The Holy Ghost is moving all over this place. The Spirit of the Lord is moving. All of my adults that are here, would you just praise the Lord out loud? Close your eyes so you can focus on Jesus. Jesus, fill your young people. Jesus, fill your children. Jesus, baptize them. I break the yoke in Jesus' name by the Holy Spirit. By the Word of God, I break the bondage over your mind. Be free tonight. Be delivered from prison in your captivity. Oh! It's starting to get real deep up here. I want it to get deep in the Holy Ghost all over. If you want to sit down, you can sit down, but start praising and worshiping Jesus. Young people are falling under the power, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost all over the altar. Oh, God, dude. <laughs> Le mande di puritana la su che ni potela su la bebana nostra The Lord's in the house worship him ever worship him worship him Oh Oh
Young people in the aisles, start worshiping the Lord out loud. I want everybody that's in the aisles, lift your voice about three times as loud, young people, and start saying, worthy are you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. The Holy Ghost comes through worship. He fills you through praise. Open up your mouth and let him hear you. Heaven's listening. Just get lost in the presence of the Lord, everybody. No rush, no hurry. Just get lost in His presence. Jesus, Jesus.
Now see, this is what this is what has been missing in the church. Number one, hunger, and you're hungry. It's all over you. You're hungry. And secondly, it sometimes means tarrying in the, in the presence of the Lord. So just make up your mind like Jacob. I will not let go until you bless me. So th just for the hungry, if you're still hungry for more, throw your hands up. And now really go after it. This is prophecy fulfilled before your very eyes this night. And in the last days, I will pour out my... Some of you never thought you would see your teenager in an altar like this again. Some of you never thought you would see your grandchild trembling under the power of God again. But God said, I'm in control. The Antichrist is not in control. Hell is not in control. Devils are not in control. God is in control. And we have a covenant for our families. So receive tonight. Receive through the blood of Jesus Christ. He shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire, Jesus said. Now reach over and touch somebody standing beside you and begin to release the power of God. For you shall receive power, Acts 1 and 8, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now release that power, release healing, release miracles, release freedom, release burden-breaking power right now in the name of Jesus. There is another wave that is forming right now. If you will give voice to it, there is another wave that is forming right now. Open your mouth. Open your mouth and give voice to it. Oh, many of you have not prayed in tongues in a long time. You need to make your voice to it right where you're standing. God's Spirit is upon you now. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus. 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 I want some of you young people to start praying for one another. Something happens when young people surround each other and begin to, I've watched it all my ministry. I've watched it as thousands of young people begin to pray for one another. It releases liberty. It releases freedom. The shackles of low self-esteem and depression and addiction are breaking this very moment. This very moment, yokes are breaking. Chains are falling. This very moment, by the blood of Jesus Christ, captives are being set free from demonic holds that have told you to kill yourself, to hate yourself, to cut yourself. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus, and it must go. Woo! Hallelujah! We cast it out in the name of Jesus.